evening. Thank you for joining us. The Magnolia Library is proud to welcome our 2017 candidates for City Councilor at Large. Tonight's guests are Jen Holmgren, Joe Orlando, Joe Shalino, Paul Lumberg, Bob Wynott, and Jamie O'Hara. Absent from tonight's lineup is Melissa Cox, who sends her regards but was unavoidably priorly committed this evening. We'd like to thank Ward 5 Councillor Sean Nolan for helping us to organize this event. We will lead off the evening with prepared questions, and then if time allows, we can move on to some questions for the audience. If you have questions that are not actually addressed, please um, visit the table at the back. You can write them down and they will be collected and presented to us, and Kurt will address them. Um, the evening will begin with two-minute opening remarks from each of our candidates. Do we know who number one is? We've drawn numbers, so everyone is already... <laughs> we'll begin with Bob Wynott. Hello, my name is Bob Wynott. I'm, uh, I've been working uh, in city politics for 25 years, 35 years, and I've been 17 years the city clerk, two terms a, a ward councillor for Ward 3, and three terms for an at-large councillor, <clears throat> and I decided to give it up two years ago but everything that's going on, I just can't sit back in my, in my living room and just crouch about everything, so I decided I'd run again. And it is me running, not my son, and I get that everywhere I go. Um, but uh, I am a man of very few words, more action, so that'll do it for me, thank you. Good evening and thank you for coming. My name is Paul Lundberg and I'm running for my third term as city councilor at large here in Gloucester. Um, I am a Gloucester native. Um, my professional career is in the railroad management business, and um, currently I serve as the uh, <coughs> the uh, chairman of the planning and development subcommittee of the uh, city council. I also serve on the boards of trustees of the Beverly and Addison Gilbert Hospital and Wellspring House, and uh, I am running for re-election because uh, I think that city government is the most effective form of government in our whole structure um, because this is a place where we, together with you, can get things done that actually impact our lives. Um, and there are small things and there are big things. Uh, the small things from, you know, our dog leash law ordinance to the big things like our tax rate and uh, the water and sewer rates. And those are all things that we can work together to make our community better. And uh, the two things that I believe in most as uh, qualifications for a city councilor is to be a good listener and to be a good team player because in the city government, we cannot do this alone. Uh, we individuals or even the mayor, we all need one another and we need the input of the citizens. So listening and team playing are what I bring to the table. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Joe Orlando, Jr and I'm running for re-election as well to Gloucester City Council at large. I want to thank the library, uh, the community center, the Magnolia Library Community Center for throwing this uh, event for us tonight. This is fantastic, it's a great turnout. We really appreciate the hard work that went into this. Um, you know, it's great for me to be here back in Magnolia where I was born. Four houses down on the right at 6 Norman Avenue where I'd walk out the front door or the side door and I'd go get a slice of pizza at Magnolia House of Pizza or get, some, get a soda that I wasn't allowed to drink at the Magnolia Variety. And you know, it's, it just feels like home again. And you know, I, I graduated from Gloucester High School in 2003, where I met my wife, Jamie, who shockingly is actually from a bigger Italian family than I am, which I didn't think was possible until I met her. She's also a lifelong Ward 5 resident. Her family's lived on Woodman Street for her whole life. You know, we eat Sunday lunch there every day. This is our home. A little bit about me and my background. I'm a graduate of Endicott College, class of 2007, the Massachusetts School of Law, class of 2010, and I'm licensed in two states, Mass and Connecticut. Um, you know, my family business, Orlando and Associates, which has been downtown Gloucester since 1980, um, is uh, where I practice as a trial lawyer. So I know some of my council colleagues will tell you they're surprised that I'm very argumentative at times, but it's not my fault. I was born this way. Now, uh, my first two years in the council, I think I learned a lot. I did a lot, but I think I learned more. And I'm hopeful for two more years to grow and build on the foundation that I built in the first two by listening, learning, learning from the good and the bad, listening to the people who have done it before, what they did right and what they did wrong. And I ran to give back. 
so, you know, it was, it was my rookie year. I'm a baseball guy. I was the captain of the baseball team at the high school, so I always bring things back to sports. And I think, you know, I did a lot, and I'm going to put myself up as a strong candidate for rookie of the year, but I would like to take the next step forward and get the September call up and go to the varsity squad and uh, play in the pros next year and really start building upon the foundation that we built. I'm very proud of my record and we'll talk about more of that tonight. And uh, I'll be looking forward to earning your vote for City Council at large for a second term. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to also thank uh, the Magnolia Library Community Center for hosting these forums. Uh, they're um, few and far between the, the selection season, so it's nice that uh, this community can get a chance uh, to ask us questions and to really see and, and, uh, and, and recognize uh, their city councilors. Um, as you know, my name is Joe Shalino. I'm currently uh, the president of the city council. I am running for my eighth term. And um, this, uh, this particular council, I've had the opportunity uh, to uh, teach five brand new counselors how to, how to be counselors and as I told them all in the past, all five have made me proud. I'm a proud uh, papa. Uh, I can see that they've done a good job and they listen and, um, and, uh, and do the constituent services. A little bit about me. Uh, I ran for 26 years. I have a shop on Main Street called uh, The Weather Vane. Uh, it's uh, known uh, uh, locally as uh, City Hall Annex downtown. <coughs> Because a lot of people know that I'm a city councilor and uh, I have an open door policy, literally. And uh, if I'm waiting on a customer, you wait, you know, you can finish with my customer, then I take, you know, I'll listen to whatever has to say or whatever problem needs to, to be solved. Um, and, uh, and I think that a lot of people are very comfortable instead of, uh, you know, going up to uh, City Hall, coming into the weather vane and uh, sharing uh, uh, their questions. Uh, in my off time, uh, I'm a, di a director of the, uh, and, and vice president of the North Shore Health Project. I'm very proud of working with that. I'm a past president of the, the Rotary Club. I'm director of the Gloucester Downtown Association. And, uh, and uh, this time of year, I put my elf hat on and I'm uh, director of the uh, Christmas Parade for, uh, for downtown Gloucester and uh, help out with the Kent Circle uh, uh, tree lighting. Uh, I've been very proud uh, to serve. Uh, I think one of the issues um, that I learned a long time ago from uh, Gus Foote uh, when, uh, when he was counsel for all those years is that you listen to what people have to say. Uh, especially uh, as city council president, I know a lot of people have a tough time coming up and doing public speaking. And I always say to them, pretend you're in the store and you're talking to me over my gas register. And uh, that kind of takes the edge off. And they come in and they say what they need to have to say. Um, I, I like also that uh, uh, I have the reputation of returning my phone calls. I return my emails. And my, if you read my signs, it says, uh, you know, uh, ability, vision, and experience. And I think that pretty much uh, uh, says what Joe Shalina was and what I bring to the council, uh, ability and the vision to move forward and the experience to make it happen. Thank you. Hi everybody, I am Jen Holmgren. I am running for counselor at large. This is my first time running for office. I want to thank uh, the Magnolia Library and Community Center. Uh, my family uh, and I have been members here for three years and we love it. And uh, Kurt, thank you for moderating. I, uh, it's great to be here with my fellow candidates, uh, people who I've worked with myself on many good things over the years here in Gloucester. My husband Terry and I are from here. I graduated from Gloucester High School in 1998. My family goes back four generations here, uh, and the fifth generation is our daughter Lizzie, who is currently a second grader at West Parish Elementary School. My great-grandfather was the architect of Our Lady of Good Voyage Church, Beauport, Sleeper McCann House, and many other buildings around Cape Ann. And my grandfather is from a Finnish quarrying family, so we are very much deeply rooted on Cape Ann and in Gloucester. Uh, currently, I'm on the City of Gloucester's new Animal Advisory <coughs> Committee, and we are trying to help the city deal with coyotes uh, and a whole bunch of uh, reviewing a whole bunch of animal ordinances, uh, seeing if we can improve them. 
Uh, and uh, everyone here has been working hard in the city for many years trying to make things better for all of you. So they all care, but why do I care? What sets me apart are my skills as a registered nurse. I worked at Beverly Hospital. I spent three years as a hospice nurse, and I'm now a home care nurse. And I love home care. It's really my thing. I see people in their own elements where the rubber meets the road. I visit people from ages 18 to 108. I work a lot with senior citizens, veterans, and people with disabilities. I am part of a care team that helps keep them safe and comfortable in their own homes. And in this city, we are faced with some challenging decisions in the years to come. As a nurse, I am able to work with people from different backgrounds to help get the job done. As a city councilor, I would use my skills as a nurse and apply them to my job here. I know how to relate to people, I know how to get to the root of problems, and I know how to figure out solutions Gloucester, uh, for Gloucester to lead its most productive, comfortable lives. It's what I do best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. My name's Jamie O'Hara. I'm from Magnolia. I'm a lifelong resident of Gloucester. Grew up here in Magnolia. Graduated in class of 1980. I have a bachelor's degree from Wentworth Institute of Technology, and I have a construction business. I'm most proud of, um, of what I've done prior to becoming a counselor, and that's dealing with, as probably most of you know, uh, the, fire, <coughs> the fire stations, or at the time, the closure of the fire stations. That um, I'm, I'm so thankful my, my lifelong friend, Doug Shafford, who uh, we, we, um, we all were at his wife's beautiful ceremony yesterday. She recently passed away. Um, but Doug and I, um, along with two other gentlemen, we started Citizens for Public Safety some 10 years ago when the city of Gloucester, which we have four fire stations, we only had one of them was typically open. And not only were people's homes burning, of which three of them burned here locally, and the last one that really burned prior to us organizing was on Ocean Ave the day after Christmas, Charlie and Jan and Marcus lost their entire home. By 10 o'clock in the morning, Magnolia Station was closed. So that's what I'm most proud of. I also, uh, here in Magnolia, the Magnolia Pier, Doug and I, and Councilor Nolan, who I, I, was great, he and I are the DPW of Shore Road, along with Doug. We keep the, the potholes between Oaks Ave and Lexington filled. Um, but we, we repaired the Magnolia Pier. Uh, when the city couldn't do it, to keep that pier, which we all love here in Magnolia. Um, but being a counselor, uh, people ask me, do you enjoy it? And I thoroughly enjoy helping people, as working with the mayor's office. Uh, sometimes we disagree, and if we disagree, we disagree professionally and respectfully. And if, if we're on the same wavelength, they we're both great friends and we, we move ahead. Um, but it's been a, a tremendous experience being on the council, working with uh, Council Lumberg, Council Orlando, uh, Councilor Shalino. It's been a tremendous experience interacting with Melissa Texaro, who's on the school committee, um, trying to get our schools to become number one. We lose so much to uh, students choosing out, and we continue to try to upgrade the school system, which is so important to the youth of Gloucester. But I, um, I'm here today, obviously, as all of us, to speak to you. And uh, hopefully, I can earn your vote, one of your four votes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie. You could stay on your feet, because uh, the first question is going to be going from six back to one. I want to remind you all uh, that the cell phone that you hear go off is a reminder that your time is up. Uh, everyone else has been nice enough to turn off their, their cell phones. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you could kind of stay with the, uh, the restraints, I'd, I'd appreciate it. The first question, uh, we would like to know how you feel about affordable housing projects in the city. Specifically, what are your thoughts on proposals of off-site housing? That's a good question, and obviously it's relative to Fuller School. Um, Fuller School, which they tie, or they're, they're using the YMCA as the off-site location. As a council, at least the best of my knowledge, on the plate, 
in front of us is Fuller School, 200 units of residential housing. We as a council have that project. Any other project is not tied to Fuller School. So we have to just consider Fuller School. Um, so the offsite is totally independent. It's a nice thought, but it's a totally separate project. We, as far as affordable housing in Gloucester, there's a tremendous shortage. Uh, I, I talk to people on a regular basis that are in need, desperate need of apartments and affordable apartments. There are apartments, but because of the limited, limited numbers of apartments, unfortunately, supply and demand, prices going up. Putting the Gloucester residents, some of whom have been here for a long time, they don't know where to go. So we, we need affordable housing. Uh, I think as a council, we're definitely open. Um, you know, we've, we've worked well and we'll look at all the proposals, but we need affordable housing in our community. We need it on every project. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting, which Council Orlando and myself and Council Blank were at, at the Maplewood School, which there's going to be 12 condominiums. Out of the 12 condominiums, two of them will be affordable housing. The developer said that, so he opened his mouth. We will carry him, make sure he does, and it will be very well uh, respected by the two recipients. So we need to look at every project and um, make sure that we conform to the city ordinance and supply those affordable units for the, the citizens of Gloucester. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> You're up. Three minutes. Same question. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I agree with Councillor O'Hara. We need to take a look at our housing ordinances and we need to explore the possibility for workforce housing uh, in our city. Uh, affordable housing is sort of a catch-all phrase uh, and it, it comes with a lot of connotations and a lot of stigma. I can share with you several personal anecdotes about people that I know personally who can no longer afford to live here. Uh, one of my best friends was just looking at an apartment in Raynham because she and her husband and their two children can't afford to live here anymore. And I just have to ask, where is Raynham? And what do they do there? Is, I know that they have a flea market, but I'm not exactly sure what else goes on there. Somewhere south of Boston, it's landlocked. Uh, it sounds like a real bummer. Uh, I would really very much like for us to look into raising our uh, affordable housing stock. We are currently at 7.4%, I believe. Uh, that's the last number I looked at. It was quite a while ago. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to look into raising that um, to above 10% to start. Uh, and that way, the people that, that I grew up with, the people that my daughter enjoys spending time with their children, uh, we can continue to foster a sense of community here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is a subject that um, is very near and dear to me. Uh, when we heard that when we did the overlay on the Fuller project, and uh, we had a public hearing, uh, and a lot of people weren't into, you know, they're all for the Y, they're all for the park, or for the shopping. But uh, the construction of uh, 200 units in Dublin was a subject of the evening. And we heard more sad stories of how people just cannot afford uh, to live in Gloucester. And when we talk about affordable housing, you know, we're not talking about subsidized housing. We're talking about somebody that will pay a little bit below market rate. And uh, the Fuller Project is a, is a golden opportunity for us to pick up 30 units. Now, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that are, that are happening on this project. And uh, they're saying that there's going to be hardship. And they're saying that, well, you're only, the, the affordable units are only going to be 80% of what uh, um, the, the regular units are gonna be. That's debatable. You know, the question we have tonight is that the loss, of our, our ordinance say that, uh, that Dublin owes us, this city, 30, 30 units. So in order to move forward, 30 units have to either be there, on site, or uh, money donated to the Affordable Housing Trust. And the off-site has to be tied to that project. Right now, there is no off-site. There's rumors, but there's no off-site. And let me get back to the affordability when it comes to uh, 
uh, uh, Doblin. You know, a lot of, you know, we all read in the paper that uh, they're kicking in 1.5 million. Well, that's not true. What they're kicking in, the, the three of them, is 500,000. The other million is coming from the sale price, which is uh, out of uh, the taxpayer's pocket. We have these regs on the books. We need to be strong. We, we know, we can listen and say, you know, if you have a hardship, but you know what? I, I listened to the planning board meeting and boy, you had to bring a box of Kleenex for all the crying they were doing. And you would say to them, if it's so difficult to build there, why don't you go away? And we'll get somebody else to come in. Our goal is not to kill the deal, but our goal is to get our 30 units. So they have to go to the drawing boards and make it work. And they can. You know, Dublin has 7,000 units all up the East Coast, plus they manage another 5,000 units. So they're not new to the rodeo here. They know well what the soil samples are, contamination, and all the rest of it. When it comes to the Cameron's building, you know, we, 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 they're doing a 40B. We pushed it through. Come to find out, they didn't have any money to do what they promised they were going to do. So they're on the queue. Uh, with the state to get the money, and so here we wait. And uh, as all the times that I've been a city councilor, uh, we have sold uh, the Mayport Avenue School probably half a dozen times. And uh, I think uh, finally, I think we have uh, you know, a sale there going. So we need to work hard. The, the regs are there, and we need to be strong. Thank you, John. Thank you. This is a really important question and a really important topic. And without addressing the merits of one particular application, you have to understand the whole breadth of the problem. I think too often we look at just, we react. We don't act proactively, okay? We're coming at this from, oh, well, someone's proposing a bunch of units. Now we have to pay attention to the problem and go solve it by making them do what we want them to do so that we can get what we want to get out of it. I don't think that's how we should, appro we should approach it. It's the position that we're in now because we didn't act proactively when I came into, uh, the, uh, into office at City Council for my first term, I became aware of this problem. The city did a housing production plan, which told us we needed over 600 units of various different types, diversity of housing, from affordable units to market rate units, from single family homes to apartments, and, and it ran the gamut. And with respect, to all, with respect to the councilors up here who are sitting now and, and with those who are running for their first term, you know, this has been a problem for a long time, a lot longer than just this last year or two when an application came in front of us. So I tried, decided to take this head on. I worked very closely with the, mayor's depart with the mayor's office and all of the people in the administration from the planning director to the DPW to the assessor's office to the building department to the health department. I had working groups. <coughs> I worked with local real estate attorneys who aren't part of city government. It took several months, six, seven, eight months, and we came up with at least a partial solution to solving this problem that doesn't require us to force feed an applicant who wants to dump a lot of money into our tax revenues to do what we want them to do when we want them to do it. Because we would be acting proactively under my ordinance. And the council, I'm very proud to say, passed it nine to nothing. And that order gives incentives for a property owner if they have a unit that needs permitting or zoning relief to get that relief through the ZBA, through a new, newly created zoning administer, I'm sorry, administrator, uh, in exchange for a deed restriction of affordable units. So we're taking an existing market rate unit and we're putting it on <coughs> the affordable rate unit, uh, affordable deed restricted unit list. And that helps us build our numbers. The state does require 10%. And we may be at 7.4% uh, on paper, but that's just not reality. The other part of this problem is we have to understand that our units at the 80% AMI level, okay, our market rate units are similar to the 80% AMI level that we're getting out of Boston and Cambridge, which is how they calculate it. So we already have a ton of units that we're not even counting because they're not deed restricted. So really, it's a whole, it's a whole humongous problem that, with great deal of respect to some of the councilors up here, has been around for a long time, and only now are they starting to address it. I've actually taken some action, and I can tell you that there's more action to take. The mayor's office has worked very closely with me on my order, which has passed. And I'm hopeful for the next three years, while it's in place, because there's a sunset clause on it, that we see a slew of new affordable housing units come onto the rolls. The mayor's office has a five-point plan that I'm very supportive of. I was in her office the other day talking about a way to get veterans and senior housing done in an affordable way. Now, my time is up, and I love talking, and I have to hand over the microphone. But this is a big problem, and it's not as easy as just making whatever applicant comes to us doing it our way. 
We have to be able to work with applicants that want to invest in our community in a way that makes the project work and makes the project work for us in a responsible way. And sometimes we don't want to tell them to go away with respect to Councilor Shalino. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Paul? Thank you. Yes, this is a, a, a critical problem. Um, uh, reference was made earlier to the housing production plan, when, and I was the, I am the city council representative on the steering committee for the housing production plan. What that plan does is, as Councilor Orlando referred to, is a proactive plan identifying the need over 600 units short of our required requirement of the state law to have affordable units. But it also identifies strategies on how to get that uh, gap uh, narrowed including uh, changes in the zoning ordinance, uh, identifying sites around the city uh, that would be uh, good sites for uh, development, and strategies on how to encourage developers to want to do this in our city. Uh, one, of the short, one of the shortcomings of the ordinance is that if a developer uh, proves a hardship and makes a contribution to the housing trust fund, we have money in the housing trust fund, but we have no vehicle as a city to develop units. We are not um, real estate developers, and there's nobody in our administration who can do that. So we need to partner with organizations that do that for, a, uh, for their mission. And just as uh, we have partnered with the uh, uh, folks who are going to uh, develop the Cameron site, um, the complication of uh, what happens up at the Fuller School is, as uh, has been alluded, um, yes, the <coughs> Ordinance calls for uh, the, the uh, developer to provide for 30 units of affordable housing. They're claiming that they have a hardship and they would like to uh, uh, have a, a site off-site to develop units, uh, but, uh, but not connected with their uh, special city council permit. Um, I think that uh, the city council can be creative in finding a way to link those two things together so that we get 30 units of affordable housing uh, as a part of this deal, and that's the thing that the City Council will be, will be working on. The Housing Production Plan, as, uh, as I said, also has a, a lot of uh, good suggestions on strategies, and um, one of them is uh, zoning, and Councilor Orlando referred to a zoning uh, ordinance that he, he did introduce it, but the City Council passed it. It was a team effort, and, and Joe did spend a lot of time on it, but so did a lot of other people, and it's a great step. Uh, in the right direction. It doesn't give us new units. It lets us count existing units, but, but it's a good step and that we will find a way to get new <coughs> units as well. When, when we started talking about the full school, I think I was a real thorn in Jim Destino's side because I didn't want to sell the property at all, especially at $4 million when 40 years ago we paid $40 million for it, and I could have bought a, a brand new Cadillac then for $7,000. Certainly can't do that now. I, I don't think uh, that we should have sold it that cheaply. First of all, we're going to have two more schools that we're going to have to do. Where are we going to put them? We're going to have to pay money to buy land to put the, put the schools on. So anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest. I think it was a bad <coughs> bargain, and I, I think uh, the city got hosed. Just like we kind of did in uh, Gloucester Crossing. You see a hotel up there? Do you see assisted living up there? No, you don't. And uh, I don't think uh, I would care if anybody wants to whine about this and say that they can't, they're having a hardship. Tough. Either, either put the affordable housing up there or, or, or just give us, you know, give us it back. Because we had, um, Jen Holmgren just talked to you about, about 7% and we need to get to 10%. And the reason we need to get to 10%, we've we'll been trying to do that for years, is because when we reach 10% affordable housing, uh, no 40B can come in here and steamroll over all of our boards and commissions. So I would like to see the 10% reached, and I would like to see people, when they, when they make a deal with the city, stick to it. And I don't want to hear hardships or anything else. So I hope we're going to, this council is going to, uh, you know, make sure that we do get what we want. Affordable housing is important, but the other thing to remember is if we keep building more housing, we're going to need more jobs because everybody can't go over that bridge to work. So we have got to think about that too. So affordable housing, yes, and more business, yes. Thank you, it was very informative. I appreciate all the, uh, all the input. You, you can keep that mic, uh, Bob, because we're gonna start with you on the next question. Uh, two minutes on that. We wanted to give you three minutes on the, the hot button 
topic, which was number one, but we're going to be uh, trying to keep you at two minutes um, in your responses for question two. And so let's hear your thoughts on private roads with public access, which no city mandated assistance is there to is is about to they can can't be being maintained by the city. So your um, your thoughts on the private road public access, please, Bob. Okay, that's easy. Um, those people pay pay a lot of taxes as well, and they need to have some services. Um, I, I think it's very important that we continue uh, patching at least patching the roads <clears throat> on the private roads with public access, because if you see some of them, take a ride down the Vista Del Mar and some of those roads down there, you couldn't get an ambulance through there, and that's a, a fire truck. So I think. I know that we don't have as much money as we had in the past, but we used to say to the private roads, we won't repave them for you un unless you have a special situation where you get accepted and, and then it's a 50-50 deal. But we will come in and patch uh, with coal patch or whatever, or even gravel, just to make those roads passable. And I think that the people that live in those, on those private roads and pay taxes, and some of them pay higher taxes than some of the ones, some of us that live on the public roads, they deserve to have, the, have those roads fixed. And I hope that we can do that in the future. And I know it takes money. And I know that, uh, Jim, you're a genius with uh, budgets and you'll have to find the money. <laughs> well, if we have a genius in the house, then why don't we all go home? <laughs> I'll stay. Uh, yeah. um, this is a huge issue all over the city because we have, this city has a, an inordinate an inordinate amount of private roads and this this tension between the uh, the abutters to the private roads the quote owners of the private roads and the city who don't own the private roads um, is one that just is uh, is festering all over the place and we don't have a good vehicle to solve that problem right now we have to encourage the uh, the uh, folks who live on the roads to uh, band together and to uh, uh, come up with a uh, an agreement among them to uh, to pave the road and that which which the city will do but then charging back to the uh, abutters uh, a, a betterment fee um, we can do better than that i think um, the uh, the financing is is complicated but it's not unsolvable um, but it is something that we need to figure out how to make this a smoother process we've we've had a couple of successes in the last uh, couple of years um, it's taken some real doing on the part of ward councilors working with the administration, um, but I think we can also uh, streamline the um, the um, the ordinance so that it's easier for the uh, owners of those private ways to uh, find a way to get together, uh, get the paving done, which is the key. And if we can get the paving done in a way that then comports with city standards then the road becomes eligible to be accepted by the city. So those are, uh, you know, it's kind of in the weeds, but we would, that's something that council really owes it to the citizens to work on. Thank you. This is obviously a huge issue for Ward 5, one of the biggest issues for Ward 5. And we should give some kudos to Councilor Nolan for passing his uh, ordinance that the council actually passed, uh, nine to nothing, I believe, uh, on private road betterment repair. He's uh, from somebody who lives on a private road for public access like I do. We have a small private road that we all take care of as neighbors, and there's a sewer pumping station at the end of it. And it's, uh, I can tell you it's not easy to maintain. It's expensive on its, on its own. But Councilor Nolan came up with a great concept to improve our ordinance on betterments. And that's what uh, Councilor Lumberg was uh, alluding to a minute ago. You know, we used to have an ordinance, and Scott Memhard and I worked together on it on Stark Knot Heights, and it was a disaster. I mean, we were trying to clean up the mess of four separate years' worth of attempts. We got through it, but the problem was there wasn't enough neighborhood input. Councilor Nolan fixed a lot of these problems. He, he put together an ordinance for private roads that made 75% of the abutters have to agree rather than 50. It put the onus uh, not on the, the private residents to hire an engineer, but the, uh, the city's engineer to, to design the, the way the road was going to be paved. Uh, it's fewer meetings, less time. It was just more streamlined and it was excellent. Um, during the time he was putting it together, he called me a few times to bounce some legal questions off me. And I was, I was so happy and so honored that he thought enough of me to ask me those questions. And I appreciate it. And, and he's such a good friend and such a great ward counselor. And so he should get kudos for that. But one of the most immediate things we can do on the public road, the private roads of public access, 
is look a little bit in some places in our budget where we might be able to trim some money and send it over to the DPW so we could increase that $30,000 budget we have for potholes. I mean, would it be nice to have 60 or 90 or $150,000 sitting there so that the DPW could give us the tools we need to fill in these potholes and maintain them longer? Because it's just not feasible to want to pave every single one of them as much as we'd like to. So, um, you know, I think it's a huge issue, especially for Ward 5, where I think 70 or 75% of the roads are, are private and many of them for public access. And in my experience, some of them are in good enough shape that we can maintain, and some of them are in such bad shape that we have to pay, and we've got to find a way to do that. So thank you. Thank you. I think a lot of, a lot of these problems that we have today stemmed in the days when uh, either the planning board or the, or the city services, it was like the Wild West. You wanted to do a development. You had a set of plans. And nobody really from the city came down and checked it to make sure that the, the road actually got built or there was drainage or anything that happened. So now, 30, 40 years later, here we are, you know, suffering it out. But I think, uh, like everybody's been saying, that uh, the city, you know, through Council of Nolan, has, has a plan. And, and that plan is to do, do an, uh, 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 our butters getting together and 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 uh, and, and paving the the uh, their street, and what is the advantage of that? Well, for one thing, if they're going to wait for the city to do it, and then you know they just can't. And, uh, there is just not enough money in, in uh, that uh, that revenues that we do that that can pay to pave all the streets. But what the city can bring to the table is that we can put that street up for bid. And the city gets the best prices around uh, to do hot topping. Plus, we can give the engineering and the drainage uh, uh, engineering to make the seat, the street, correct and uh, and usable. And after that, that's all said and done. You know, everybody gets an abatement. And you know, when you divide it up by the number of houses and the number of lots, it really. You know, we did it on my street, High Poplar Road. It doesn't amount to a lot of money, and you have uh, 10 years uh, to pay it off. So, but uh, also you have a nice street with good drainage. But after it's all said and done, <clears throat> the street also can petition the city now to take it over, and the city will take over the street and maintain it and and do what what needs to be done. So at least now we have a plan and uh, to move forward, and it seems very popular. We just did Brooks Road. And everybody's delighted about it. Thank you. Well, I have attended Ward 5 meetings uh, wherein this was the primary topic. I very much appreciate Councillor Nolan's work on this. He's really spearheaded uh, this effort, and I sympathize wholeheartedly with the people who are dealing with this issue. Um, the city's budget is extremely lean, uh, and I certainly think that it would be worth the city council's while to take a look and see what sort of money can be shifted around. I'm not sure what could be trimmed at this point. Uh, we have a lot of things that do need to be paid for, but uh, certainly safety is a concern. Um, I uh, am a little interested in knowing why we're concerned about ambulance and fire truck access on private roads, but not on Prospect Street. Mr. Why not? But I guess that might be a question for another time. Um, but uh, I think that it's important to take a look and see um, what we can do to help ease the burden on residents living on private roads because I certainly understand my husband and I lived on a private access way in Bayview and it was, it was a nail biter trying to figure out how to maintain it. Thank you. Thank you. And as uh, everyone has mentioned, it's a very large problem in Ward 5. The main issue at the present is safety. Uh, as has been mentioned, getting emergency equipment, fire trucks, ambulances, Inglewood Road is a mess as being one of them. Shore Road, obviously, everyone's walked it, and I joked about it earlier, but it's a serious issue. A woman over in Lanesville, and this exists all over the city, she lives on Rowley, Rowley Shore, pays $24,000 in taxes annually to the city. She has a pothole in front of her house. Costs her $4,500 to have it fixed. She's not very pleased with that. Now that exists, you, you can go down any road in Gloucester, Magnolia, any, any part of our city, 
and count the houses and run the numbers. The city gets a lot of money for those, for those houses on those private roads. We need to, obviously, Council Nolan, as everyone's discussed, we've improved the, the system, but ultimately the taxpayer is going to pay. We're paying for the neglect of past administrations, past councillors, councils that didn't accept private roads, and it wasn't a big deal because the city was maintaining the roads. In fact, I'll reference Charlie Marcus again. He showed myself and Council and Olin a year and a half ago his deed. It says he lives on Ocean Ave. It says that his road is a public road. Most people don't realize that they live on private roads. They do now because they're living in a pothole filled roadway. And that's a sad way to figure that out. Obviously we talk about the cup the colors of the signs, but we need to find the money. We need, and, and it's not our present administration. Again, this is past, past administrations that neglected going through the system and chasing, making private roads public. So as one counselor, and I know the, the balance of the council, this isn't anything that we're just pushing aside. We need to address the problem and fix the problem and not put the burden on the taxpayers. Thank you, thank you all very much. That was uh, very informative. The next question, uh, we are here in Ward 5, so we have to have a, a strong Ward 5 question. And if there was one sidewalk that could be installed in Ward 5, where do you feel is the best place for that to be placed? Let's start with Joe Salino, please. I have been working for years uh, with uh, Senator Tarr and then Margaret Ferranti. And, um, and, I, and it's uh, Essex Avenue, you know, going uh, when it goes to uh, the, uh, the West Gloucester School. Um, and uh, the children, you know, walk, walk that sidewalk. And it complicates things because it's a state highway. And we have to go through the state to get it done. And we have done that, but uh, the state has priorities <clears throat> and they don't consider that little piece a priority. Uh, I feel that, uh, you know, the West Parish School, uh, you know, anything, any of uh, the leader roads, <clears throat> excuse me, going to that school should have sidewalks. And especially the way, you know, people drive nowadays. Just, just recently, you know, going around and putting out my signs, I wear a bright yellow t-shirt because I can't believe how fast people drive in this town. And, and then you look at the cars and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're using their cell phones to boot. So it's a dangerous situation and we need to put the children on sidewalks. And, uh, and I would say parts of uh, uh, Essex Avenue when it comes uh, to the junction uh, to the West Parish School, those uh, should have sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Council Shalino in part. I think. Essex Ave is not the problem, it's Concord Street. The entrance to the new West Parish School is on Concord Street. That's the number one most important place in Ward 5 to put a new sidewalk. It's a windy, narrow, old road that was really never designed for the amount of traffic it gets. People come off that highway and they've just been doing 60 or 70 and, and you know, we're human beings. It's blind corners and we have children. And I, I know, <laughs> You know, my kids are going to be coming into the Gloucester school system pretty soon. And if I had to choose an elementary school for them to go to right now, it would be West Paris, that brand new beautiful building. Well, I think we have to finish the job here and get that sidewalk done on Concord Street. Uh, that is the number one most important thing from my perspective. A close second, not that close, but a close second is Hespers Avenue. It, it's a beautiful street. It leads right into the heart of Magnolia. And basically after, I don't know, after... Ocean, I guess, there's really, really after Hesperus and Norman Ave meet, there's really no sidewalk after that. And I think that's a really long stretch. There's the Hammond Castle down there, and that's another place that could use a sidewalk. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic walking up and forth, back and forth there. I saw a lovely lady when I was knocking on doors up and down Hesperus Avenue, pushing her granddaughter in a, an old plastic car, and she was trying really hard to stay off to the side because there's a lot of blind corners on that road, that road too. I just think for safety's sake, first conquered, Dan Hesperus, and I'm glad to see that Magnolia Avenue got some love recently from the DPW. It looks good. Thank you. Paul? I'm going to echo what uh, other councillors have said about Concord Street near the West Parish School. That really it seems to me to be the key. 
location for uh, some sidewalk engineering. Um, it is all the things everyone said, safety and uh, access, and uh, that's what uh, sidewalks are all about. So that's the uh, one place that uh, I would focus on. I agree that uh, any, any place near a school uh, needs to have sidewalks, and, uh, I un and they're not on, on Conquer Street, they, they don't have enough sidewalks, and we don't have them in other parts of the city. Gloss is an old city, and when, they, when, they, when we built these roads, we didn't expect all the people to be living on them uh, and, and have, with, no, with no driveways and uh, no sidewalks. And uh, one of the things uh, about, about that is when you take away the parking, people drive faster. And that happens on Prospect Street across from the church. And, it ha and I talked to the fire chief and I said, if, if I had asked you about any of many of the 50 other streets on, on Ward 2, uh, would it be tough to get a fire truck in there with parking? He said yes, I would have to say yes, because if I say no and something happens, then it, I own it. So I do think we need more sidewalks. There's none on Thatcher Road either, uh, going down towards the beach, and there's not enough on, on Concord Street or Essex Avenue, because I was putting up signs too, and you take your life in your hands. So that's what I think uh, would the emphasis should be on. Thank you, I want to pass it back to uh, Jen. I completely agree. We send our daughter to West Parish and, <clears throat> excuse me, we live within two miles of the school, which means that we have to pay $100 a year in order to send her to school on the school bus, but I am extremely nervous walking her. We live on the corner of Magnolia Ave and Essex Ave uh, at the apex of the little heater, and I would rather her, I would rather pay the hundred dollars a year, send her to school on the bus, know that she's getting there safely. I see parents dropping their children off at school uh, and coming off of Concord Street and truly people do fly up that hill. It is, it is frightening and Concord is extremely narrow uh, in that bend in the road right uh, before the school, uh, right before number, what is it, 12, 14. Uh, and in, in my ideal world, sure, um, I'd love to have a sidewalk there. I know it's a matter of cost and maintenance, but that, that would be my priority. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's no hidden secrets. Everyone's talked about where the sidewalks should go. The more important issue is Gloucester is a very large city. Magnolia and West Gloucester represent 50% of the land mass of Gloucester. We have one councilor, Councilor Nolan. He represents 11.11% of the vote, there are nine of us. Again, 50%, 11%. We need more money earmarked for Magnolia. We need more representation for this, for this ward, Ward 5. Obviously, I've been knocking on doors all over the city. Go over to Lanesville. It's concrete granite curbs. We're very thankful that we got Magnolia out repaved with asphalt. It does the job. I think it's personally unsafe because there's no divider, but it's better than nothing. But we need more representation, more dollars earmarked for Magnolia to address the issues of sidewalks, the potholes. West Parish School is just a matter of time before there's an accident. Go over there and when the school's being discharged, I found out. It's a nightmare waiting to happen. Cars are parked in both directions coming up Essex, or coming up Concord Street. You, you take that corner, you don't know that there's cars sitting there waiting for their child to be dismissed. So we have some major problems that our council, our administration needs to face. And again, we need representation. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad that uh, you all feel that uh, our children are your priority. It's, uh, it's nice to hear. Uh, the next question. Uh, last year, Councilor O'Hara headed up a comprehensive ad hoc committee to study beach traffic. Which of the committee's suggestions, if any, would you like to see implemented to improve the flow of traffic to and from Wingersheek Beach during the peak beach season? And let's start with Jen. Well, in an ideal world, 
it would be nice to have a similar setup to Rockport and have people shuttled to the beach. Winger Chic is, the parking is absolutely insane. Uh, I don't even attempt to go there. Um, uh, well, I work every Saturday as a visiting nurse, but on Sundays, I don't attempt to bring my daughter there at all. We just wait. Um, we plan family beach days for weekdays because the, week, the weekends are absolutely horrendous. I've heard that, that parking is backed up to the highway. Uh, I know that space is limited in Gloucester, uh, and I know that we have a, a lot of priorities, but uh, it would be really nice to have people shuttled to the beaches from other areas, especially if they're coming from out of town, uh, and that would ease the burden on our residents who pay for beach stickers every year. Thank you. Joe? <coughs> uh, <coughs> The committee made a lot of good recommendations, and a lot of those recommendations went to the administration, and uh, because uh, they're the ones that uh, would have to put it forward to the council for any changes. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the ideas, some some of them that came through by you know putting kiosks in and in the parking lots, but uh, but I think that uh, you know the administration is is doing uh, pretty much what it can do in an almost impossible situation. We know we put up the, the electric signs up to say that the beach is closed. Um, I think we need, you know, I think there's a little organization with the Y and Camp Spindrift, you know, by having somebody there that uh, can um, direct traffic and, you know, when everybody's leaving Camp Spindrift and then you have the beach traffic leaving, it just makes it, makes it very, very difficult. Um, as, as city councilors, uh, we hear it all the time that uh, people that live near the beaches and, and uh, suffer through whatever the summer traffic is. And, and a lot of times when I've asked them, I said, well, when did you buy your house? Oh, well, we, we, we closed in January. Well, didn't you know that you were living next to a beach? There's, there's just so much that we can do. And I have a lot of friends that live up there. And uh, they, you know, they tell me that they just have to organize their day. Uh, you know, knowing that the, tra the traffic is there. So we you know we do have the police. I think we, we, we talked about kiosks, and uh, sometimes I know that's gonna be a little bit difficult uh, to uh, handle, uh, because if we start taking charges instead of cash, that's even gonna complicate things even more. Uh, so, you know, we need, we need to really move and, 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 and get, get people in and out. But the notification, of, and the other problem that we have also is that you talk to a lot of the visitors and, um, and they'll, they'll say, well, they know there's gonna be, by the time I get to the beach, there's gonna be a spot opening up. And uh, so they, you know, they get in the line and they wait. And then you have the other situation where there's residents who are looking for a secure spot, you know, for, for residents in the lot. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. We have uh, tried uh, to uh, find a way to make it easier. But uh, it's, a, it's a tough three months, and I think we all realize that, that if you live in that area or live near the beaches, uh, you, you enjoy it nine months out of the year, but uh, you know you have to put up with what's there, unfortunately. Grab it. Thank you, Joe. Joe Landa. Thank you. I wasn't sure if I was gonna have to grab it. <laughs> uh, well, the ad hoc committee did a wonderful job. I commend Councilor O'Hara and the members of the ad hoc committee. Um, in my capacity as liaison on the City Council of the Tourism Commission, we've taken a really hard look at this, uh, at this study, among others, in other areas that we've done in the city over the past several years. And I think the two best recommendations, one was park and ride, uh, because one of the things we're seeing is the traffic is uh, stacking up on Thatcher Road at Good Harbor and on Concord Street and then on Atlantic for, for Winger Chic, and we're really kind of behind the eight ball by the time these people are already on these streets telling them to turn around or putting a sign up at uh, exit 14 telling them to turn around and go home. I would rather we have a system where we can send them into a central location and have a sign up that says, hey listen, Good Harbor's full or Winger Sheik's full, but Stage 4 Park is open and they've got some beautiful beaches down at Stage 4 Park and some open grass area and the like. Uh, so the park and ride was one I thought was an excellent recommendation. The second one was a little bit more funky and, and more specific, but I thought it was really, really smart. And that is, at the corner of Concord and Atlantic, there's that awkward long island separating the two lanes of the road. And that island makes it impossible to turn around unless you're doing a 64 point turn like in Austin Powers. I don't know if you remember that movie. Uh, but the, the thing is, it, you know, it, it makes not only, if you, if you tell the person to turn around, you're creating more traffic because they have to go up and turn left and then back and then 
back and forth until they get out. So we could either do a cut through with that island or eliminate that island. That would be really smart. And the third thing I would like to see with respect to Wingersheek is Causeway Street used to send people into town rather than 128 to send people out of town. Say, listen, if you know what, this one's full. Head down Causeway Street, get back on 128, head into town and go to Stage 4 Park. We might have some openings there. So signage, an organization, and I think that park and ride. Those are excellent recommendations, and I commend the Ad Hoc Committee for doing so. Thank you, Paul. Um, you know, obviously the uh, cars going to these parking lots at the, at, the, at the end of a very long, narrow street is, is not a good solution. And the park and ride is definitely a, an answer to increase the amount of people who can access the beach without bringing their cars there. Um, the question is, how do you control that? And I think that uh, one of the things that uh, the, uh, the recommendations is to, is to improve the uh, real-time uh, information on the signs so that people know where and where to go and, and when to go and to have some control. Right now, it's kind of, we do have signage, but uh, we have no control. Um, it's a special uh, problem for us, you know, if you think about going to the parking lot at the Logan Airport, which is running 365 days a year, they know when to turn it off and move people around. We're talking about 20 to 25 days a year, and uh, we just, you know, that's a temporary thing that we got to figure out how to do best. But I think some, the, the, some real-time uh, management of the, uh, of the information of where to go and when to stop going over <coughs> the beach is what we need to do. I think that uh, the shuttle idea may work for Wingersheek Beach, but my experience is when the, when the parking lot is full at Good Harbor Beach, then the beach is full, especially at high tide. You can't even walk between the blankets and, and, the, and the beach towel. So I don't know if, that's, if that would be a good idea. I do like the idea that Joe said about uh, turning people around, but I think we should do it sooner. I, you know, I know that we put something out on 128 at one time, and I think Rockport complained that uh, we were stopping people from going. We should have a sign out there that says either Good Harbor Beach closed or uh, Wingersheek open, the, uh, the Stage 4 Park open, and it should be before they take that turn into Concord Street. And we can get a permit from the state for that if we have to. And I think that's the way to do it. Um, and speaking of sidewalks, uh, if you're going down Thatcher Road uh, towards Good Harbor Beach, there are no sidewalks at all. And uh, somebody told, someone told my cousin, who lives right there, uh, that not, one more person has to get killed before he can put sidewalks there, because there's only been two. And I just think that's crazy. I never, I didn't, I didn't really research that, but uh, it's definitely something that should be done. You see people walking down there, and they're taking their life in their hands. So that would, that would help at least people could walk to the beaches. So, anyway. Thank you, Bob. Pass the mic back to the uh, author of this ad hoc committee. Thank you. I don't know if it's fair for me to answer this, but um, the, the, the wrong answer is do nothing. Obviously, the Wright brothers developed the plane. They crashed a few times. We need to change something. Maybe it's not going to be the right, the exact method of fixing a problem. We're not going to eliminate the traffic. Obviously, Gloucester's been discovered. We have lovely beaches. They're well kept, very, very clean. The, the people are coming, the visitors are coming to our city. We need to figure out how we're going to bring them in, park them, as, as we've talked about the signs, the signs presently at Essex Ave, the first sign. Most of the people are rushing to the beach, probably breaking the speed limit. By the time they come down 128 down the hill, they see the sign, they're in the passing lane, guess what? They're too late, they've already missed the turn. So we need to move the sign more to the south, and we need more signs. We have a beautiful beach at Cressy's Beach. Uh, it's, it's covered with rock. One of the ideas was to clean the rock. We can do that legally. But we need to do something. And we have plenty of ideas that were uh, well thought out by the Beach and Visitor Traffic Ad Hoc Committee. We just need to make the changes. We may fail, might need a little tweaking, but let's do something and we'll improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Continuing with Ward 5, um, how do you feel that we can help Ward 5 
with its open spaces, parks, and recreational trails. Why don't we start with Paul? Well, I think that the, the, the most uh, important thing that we can do is, uh, is to uh, come up with a way to uh, uh, get the, uh, open the Magnolia Woods and make it more accessible for longer periods of time. And, um, you know, there's, there's the issue of, of, uh, of uh, control of the use of, the, uh, of that uh, facility, uh, you know, all the time. And the gate is sometimes locked and sometimes open, and the way, that's a city resource thing. But that is a tremendous uh, resource. It connects to lots of trails. It connects across the street to uh, Ravenswood. And we just have to do a better job of, of ut utilizing. There's parking there. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of space and a lot of uses for that. So I think that the, uh, the city needs to figure out a better plan for uh, accessing the Magnolia Woods. Thank you. Bob? I would have liked to have had a golf course there, but that didn't work. But anyway, I had, I had somebody uh, that's a friend of mine say that it was, uh, Magnolia Woods was full of litter and, and it was uh, a mess. And I drove in there and I didn't see any litter. I was with my wife that day, we drove through. The only thing I thought maybe could be done is have the tiger go over there and clean out some of the vegetation along the sides. Um, but it looks like it's in pretty good shape to me. So, and, and Ravenswood, uh, I haven't been there in a long time, so I couldn't tell you, but anyway. Thank you. I mean, we have some jewels, especially in Ward 5, for open space and historic space and the like. Um, what we have to do is we have to preserve those and emphasize those for a lot of reasons, for the people who live here right here in Gloucester to enjoy, and for purposes of tourism, because Stage 4 Park's a perfect example right here in Ward 5, the tourist, um, the visitor center, and the beaches there, and the park, and all the other things that people can enjoy with a beautiful, huge parking lot that we can raise revenue from. Uh, I would like to see the continued efforts by, uh, the community, by uh, Steve Winslow, who's been doing a wonderful job uh, preparing some you know, upgrades and, and the like with grant funding to Stage 4 Park, and the connectivity of Stage 4 to Ravenswood and the trails and the like. I mean, that is just going to be absolutely beautiful if it comes to fruition, and I'm hopeful that the council will get behind that project and support it, because it's a great thing for our community, and it's a great thing for preservation of hope, open space and historic space. And, you know, I'm not just going to talk the talk on these issues. I walk the walk. When a historic space is very important in a community like ours, a very historic community. And you know I'm not just going to talk the talk when I say this because I've done it. I've rolled up my sleeves myself, literally, and gone down to historic spaces in town, namely Clark Cemetery. And along with Councilor O'Hara as well, I appreciate his, his assistance along with the project. And we really, we gathered volunteers, 30 or so volunteers, Senator Tarr's office, uh, professional landscapers. We cleared it out. We made it look like a cemetery again. And that's just one example of what we can do to really beautify our historic spaces. There's some work being done at the Cannons in Stage 4 Park. I think that's going to be, it's going to be excellent when it's done. And we should really be driving visitor traffic to this place so they can look at all Gloucester has to offer. There's, no, there's not much of a better view than from Stage 4 Park for visitors. And we can really capitalize on that and, and drive revenue to the community. And at the same time, preserve for our residents a beautiful resource that we know we have in Ravenswood. So um, I think one of the most important things we can do is drive those grant funds to places like Stage Fort Park, to places like Ravenswood, create places for parking so people can enjoy them. And, uh, and I agree also on the Magnolia Woods point. So there's a lot we can do, and we've got to take it piece by piece, and they're already doing it, and we should just emphasize that and jump on it. Uh, Ward 5 is uh, blessed with more open space probably than, uh, you know, most of Gloucester and, and uh, people from all the other wards, you know, come to this ward to enjoy uh, the Magnolia Woods and the uh, um, Ravenswood, plus uh, a lot of the other trails that are there. Uh, during the past few years of council, one of the things that this council did was to revise and strengthen the Magnolia Woods uh, uh, committee and, uh, and, it's, and uh, the Sage Four Park Committee. And it has been uh, my philosophy that uh, these, these recreational areas need a mother and father. They need advocates. And, uh, and it's been very successful down at Stage 4 Park. And it's been also successful in the Magnolia Woods to, to manage their property. I believe it's the city's responsibility to make sure that that uh, 
the upkeep of the property with the, cutting the grass and, and doing the maintenance and doing the little cleanup that needs to happen. But I also think that at some point in time, and uh, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Destino agrees with me, that there should be a map of all the open space that you have here and how to get there and how to enjoy it and where there are parking facilities. Uh, and, uh, and I think if we're looking for ways to tie open space, uh, a map that we can hand out to, uh, to visitors and to the people that live in Gloucester is a way to do it. One of the things that I've always proposed that uh, we, we can't build on every piece of lot that's available. We have to keep open space and that's what attracts us to Gloucester and that's what attacks you, attracts us to living here in Magnolia and, and West Gloucester is the open space. And so uh, we have to be careful with development also. And we also need to partner with Greenbelt. If there's any property that any of us knows that's kind of going to come onto the market, uh, we need to talk to them and, and see how we can raise the money to buy that property and get it off the, uh, uh, the buildable uh, roads so we can preserve it for our children. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing that we can't uh, recreate, and that's open space. And uh, we're very lucky here in Gloucester. And, uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, I will work, as I have in the past, uh, to keep the Magnolia Woods and, and, and all the parks that we have in, uh, in Magnolia and West Gloucester open and in good shape. Thank you. Thank you. Jen. <clears throat> I agree with Councillor Orlando and Councillor Shalino. We need to preserve our historic open spaces, and it would be really great if we could develop some sort of map of Gloucester's West Gloucester and Magnolia, especially our treasure trove of uh, open space and green space. And that's not only the space that belongs to the city, but also Greenbelt and the trustees of reservations. I'll tell you a, a small personal story. We moved to West Gloucester three years ago, and we moved to an, a house that we have recently learned, uh, thanks to Prudence Fish and the Historic Commission, was built circa 1812. And I decided that I was going to go down the rabbit hole of history and hunt uh, to see if I could find the owner of our home. And I, I went to the Registry of Deeds website almost every single day. I was up until 2 a.m. looking and seeing what I could find. And what I found out was that the home was owned by an Ebenezer James, uh, whose father-in-law was Zebulon Stanwood. And I promise there is a point to this story. So I decided to research the Stanwood family, and I learned that as many colonial West Gloucester families did, they attended the Second Parish Church, which is on Thompson Street, uh, which is over off of Bray Street, and it's in this really beautiful secluded area of the woods. Uh, not many people go, there's not much parking, and I, that's what I love about it. Uh, people do run their dogs up there, uh, and I decided to go one day and, and take a hike in the woods and, and check out exactly where Second Parish was. I became closer to Gloucester uh, when I finally found it. It's this beautiful little clearing in the woods with, with pews and a cross uh, and, a, and a rock a sculpture. And uh, it, it just, the fact that we can feel more connected to our heritage and to nature uh, just in our own backyards is very special to me. And uh, I hope that um, we, as a, as a city, and a, the city council can continue uh, preserving our heritage for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, obviously, we've talked about the open spaces there. The city of Gloucester's open spaces. I think it's more important that we maintain those open spaces. We, as a city, we pay the tax back to the taxes. We deserve to have those maintained. Obviously, we, we see the boulevard today, uh, it's beautiful. A few years ago, it wasn't so beautiful. Our administration's working harder. We're getting new equipment for our DPW to maintain the equipment, to maintain the open spaces. Uh, our DPW has been cut significantly. We need to build up the DPW with personnel, but we also need management. I hear complaints, knocking on doors of issues that not phone calls that aren't returned. I hear it countless. We need to 
be able to provide the service to the citizens. The open space has to be maintained. We need the management. Our administration is doing the job with the dollars. Um, we have an abundance of trees. I, I'm not looking forward to this winter. We haven't maintained our trees for a long time. Hesperus Ave, if we have a heavy snow with the leaves on the trees, those trees are going to be laying on Hesperus Ave. So we need to look at our entire city as far as the, the management, the equipment, staffing, to be able to maintain, as Councilor Orlando said, I, along with my crew, we spent uh, two full days with my equipment, my manpower, uh, cleaning up uh, First Parish and Clark Cemetery. Grass was this high. You know, th this is a cemetery where people are buried. It's owned by the city of Gloucester. We need to do a better job, and we're doing a better job. We just need to step it up and continue to clean the city, mow the city, plow the snow. We can't leave the onus on, vol volunteers are great, but volunteers have a short shelf life. They come and they go. We pay taxes, we need to take care of it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, back to the city is uh, in large. What is your vision for Gloucester's marine, industrial, and designated port area? More specifically, do you see any rezoning of the Fort neighborhood? Start with Joe Orlando, please. I think this is actually a pretty easy one. I'm a descendant of a commercial fishing family. My grandfather owned an eastern rig dragger that he and his brother fished on called the Blue Surf. And we are America's oldest fishing port. This, this is what people come to see. I'm all for, I'm on the Tourism Commission, and I'm all for emphasizing the economic engine that is tourism. But what are these people coming to see when they come to see Gloucester? There's a lot of seaports, but we're the only oldest seaport in the country, the oldest fishing port in the country. So those properties with those deep water access and those piers and, those, and that infrastructure, those need to be preserved as MI zone. Those need to be preserved within the DPA because once you give those away to some other use, you never get it back. Now, I know we've served a lot of our control of the fishing industry over to the federal government, and it's a long, sad history of 50 years of bad decisions in that regard. But here we are. So the control we have left is to make those properties in the MI zone and the DPA to invest in those properties, to fix them up, to make them as marketable as we possibly can, to help the owners of those properties if for some reason their business does not survive, to make that property marketable to the next MI use, whether that be tidal energy, whether that be seaweed farming, it could be anything. There's a lot of things coming down the pike. We've got some innovators right here in this audience who have innovated ways to keep MI uses on Commercial Street. Now, that doesn't mean every single one of the properties is perfect for that. I supported the hotel being built on Commercial Street because I thought that was a beachfront property and not a deep water access property. But the, most of them are. And it's the MI zone for a reason. And we need to preserve that for the hope that we can recreate what we used to have for the fishing industry or change it so that we have it in the future. Because that is what we are. That's our tradition. And preserving tradition is more than just preserving open spaces of history. It's actually fostering the very core of our traditional values and our traditional heritage here in Gloucester. So I wholeheartedly hope that they stay MI and DPA for the most part up and down that area. Uh, very briefly though, I will say that this, this question is really a broad one. My, my great grandmother owned a little grocery mart on 33 Commercial Street and it occurs your Orlando. She didn't speak a lick of English. Okay, so the area is very important. My office is right up the street and we need to responsibly develop. Responsibly means look out for preserving our history. Thank you. Which way? Thank we you. The question is about uh, rezoning the fort, yes. one of them. Uh, I have met with a lot of the, the residents of the fort, and when we went to the permitting of the Port um, uh, Hotel, uh, the notion was that uh, to create an overlay over the whole fort, and uh, the neighbors um, objected and said, no, we're very happy with the way it is. And I've had a conversation with uh, a lot of the neighbors and they're not interested in uh, any rezoning. They're very happy with the way it is. 
And I've had conversations with uh, people that uh, own the commercial waterfront property, and they're very happy with the way things are. It's a complicated area because what you have is you have businesses, and then you also have homes. And so in, uh, in, the, in the MI district, if you have to do some remodeling in your home, it's a little bit, a little bit more difficult. You have to make a stop at, uh, at the GBA. But um, Councilor Gigoloni had a, a ward meeting that I went to, and there was a lot of people, and that question came up. And so moving forward, uh, you know, I would not be supporting uh, rezoning. And I think the people are very happy with the way things are down there. I think what they need is we have to work on parking, and, uh, and that's uh, foremost on, uh, I think, everybody's mind to find a way uh, to do that. Uh, also, when we're talking about the marine industrial area, uh, you know, years ago, we, we changed things over, so uh, it's a 75-25% use. So if 25% can be marine-related, and then 75% can be another use on, on a piece of property. Uh, so that's there. And, um, but uh, a lot of the situations that are down there, especially down the Ford, is, is parking. Where do you put the cars? And any future planning, uh, and I think we've learned, uh, I learned a, a big lesson with Beauport, is that where's the parking and is it realistic? And, uh, and I think uh, moving forward, I think that, that, that conversation needs to be had. Thank you. Thank you. Jen? Well, the fishing industry here is our heritage. It's economically important, and I know that these continue to be challenging times, and the council must continue to do what it can to support the fishing industry. Uh, we have to make an effort to be responsive uh, to mixed industrial uses around the DPA. We need to think broadly about the industrial use of our harbor and bringing jobs back, jobs that maybe complement the fishing industry. And, for example, we, have, we use Neptune's harvest in our garden, and that plus black earth compost is single-handedly responsible for our tomatoes and onions this year, so thank you. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we need to look to organizations like Ocean Alliance, uh, GMGI, which I know is at Blackburn, uh, Endicott College, um, and uh, other, other STEM organizations to sort of complement and broaden our uh, scope within this particular field. Uh, and if I'm elected Gloucester's fishing industry and the fort will certainly have my support. Thank you. Thank you. I think the question was not only the fort, but the harbor, correct? That's correct. Yeah. You said Thank you. Rezoning of the fort, though. Right, right. right. Um, as was mentioned, it's a small area. The fishing industry isn't controlled by the city of Gloucester. That's a federal, federal issue. They seem to have the stranglehold on the fishing industry. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be released anytime soon. The wharfs are clearly collapsing into the harbor as it happened uh, just recently. Um, the end of the fort where Cape Ann Seafood was and, and the Cookaroo Brothers, that's gone. Um, you know, we need to develop that area. We need to be able to allow the owners to do something with their property. Uh, that, and that carries through all the way around to East Gloucester. The wharfs are collapsing because the, the owners of them have a, a strangled by the zoning. Um, we need to be open-minded, as has been talked. You know, preserving our heritage is important, but the landowners also have to have the ability to maintain their property and do something that will be financially uh, rewarding to them that may more than likely create jobs. So I think we, need, as a council, as a city, we need to look at the, at the zoning um, to open it up uh, with caution and with insight from the neighbors, because this is, this is our city. It's not the council city. It's not the mayor's city. It's our city. So having, having everyone input, we all love our city. Having everyone show up at our meetings and participate will help us lead us down the road to something which is of success. But we definitely need to change something other than having derelict wharfs, which we drive around the, the harbor, we see. So what is happening isn't working. Thank you. Thank you. Pass it down to Paul, please. 
First, to the specific uh, question about rezoning the fort, um, probably no good reason to want to do that that I can tell. Um, we do have to address the issues of property owners and their evolving use of their properties and, and what, how that butts up against the marine industrial and the designated port area. Um, we are very fortunate to have those two protections to the waterfront. Um, I think that uh, uh, Joe uh, spoke uh, eloquently about the fishing industry the way that it was. Um, it's changing. It's evolving. It's not to say it's going away. It's going to be something different. And I think that entrepreneurial uh, uh, interests are going to find ways to use the ocean for protein, and uh, we need to provide the infrastructure uh, to access the ocean. Uh, one of the things that uh, always is a, a question that I uh, raise, and one thing that the city needs to figure out, is those uh, parcels of land that are on the harbor that have nothing to do with water dependent uses anymore. And I speak specifically about the Americold facilities, which when they were built, they were built on the harbor because the fish came in by ship and were offloaded into those, uh, into those cold storage. No more. Those, uh, those uh, facilities could be in Danvers at the uh, junction of Route 128 and 95 because it's in by truck and out by truck. So there's huge parcels of waterfront uh, that, are, that are dominated by non-waterfront uh, use. Now, they're grandfathered, of course, and, this is a, and, and there's economic interest of the private companies that own those. But when we look at the harbor and we look at what strategic use we want to make of it, that's got to be part of the equation. Gloucester will always have fishing, but it's never going to be like it was in the 50s or 60s. I think that, that, that time has passed. Uh, so we need to protect, we need to protect what we have, and we need to make sure there'll be, there'll be some resurgence of the, of the fishing industry, I think, and we need to have enough for the boats that will be coming and maybe a processing plant. But we also need to let, I, I agree with uh, my uh, comrade down the end, the, the big tall guy down there. <laughs> but that could be any of you, actually. Um, you said another one. That we do need that we do need to do something for the people, and I think we did that a little bit for the ice house, uh, give them an opportunity to put a little something upstairs, and I think the three lanterns isn't that the name of it over in uh, Rocky Neck? They they seem to have uh, survived by using the have the sheet be and the uh, MI, and then above it you should be able to put something else so you can make a living because we don't want them to just uh, deteriorate and rot. So I think we need to strike a balance between protecting what we have for the fishing industry and also uh, some growth for the people that uh, may, may not be able to make a living in the fishing industry anymore. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we had asked for written questions from the audience. I don't think we've received any. Uh, unless someone has one that hasn't been brought up. But I'll take some. Do you want to take them from the audience? I'll take them from the audience now if nobody uh, passed one in. This gentleman here. Please. My question is what are your views with regards to pop shops in Gloucester? Did you hear that? Pot shops in Gloucester. Did you want to direct that to a, any particular counselor, or would you like the whole range to answer? Okay. Jen, would you start? So this is a very complicated and contested issue in a number of ways. In 2016, 58% of the city of Gloucester did vote in favor of recreational marijuana. There were a lot of misconceptions about the law, uh, as we have learned, uh, and the state is still trying to iron out details. I have a seven-year-old daughter. Uh, my husband and I are concerned, uh, as I think probably any parent of an elementary school, middle school, or a high school student would be. Uh, as to whether or not she would be able to get her hands on marijuana, and I'm talking specifically about an edible product at this point. Uh, but that said, marijuana is here in Gloucester, and we need to deal with it. And we have been brave enough as a community to deal with issues regarding drugs, alcohol, and tobacco in the past. Uh, we are 
certainly capable of handling it. Uh, I do support the moratorium. Uh, I think it's a very good idea for the city to uh, get ready uh, for retail establishments to open up because it sounds like they're coming. Uh, and I certainly do want to make the distinction between uh, recreational and medicinal marijuana. And uh, we have a large facility that's going to be opened up at Blackburn for people who need it for medical reasons. And uh, I, I do support that. I've had patients who've had very good experiences with medicinal marijuana. The city uh, infrastructurally is not ready yet for retail establishments. I attended a couple of the marijuana task force uh, open meetings uh, um, as led by Councillor Gilman back there. Uh, she really she worked very hard to get the word out to the different wards, uh, and the meetings, as as far as I know, were well attended. So uh, that's that's a brief view from me. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. It's a loaded question, as um, Jen was talking about. Uh, it was, we all have personal feelings and professional feelings. Our professional feelings are we represent the people, and the people voted for marijuana in our state. So it, it's here. Now it's dealing with the issue. Uh, people have great reservations, as we've had. We had five listening posts, one of them being here, where people are concerned, and the city is as well, the administration, the council, and we're going to move along slowly. Uh, we voted the moratorium uh, for one year, uh, await the state to at least they have a few more dollars than we have to investigate how this is going to be enacted into the, into the system. We need to train our police officers because there's going to be all kinds of issues from this. Enforcement, who goes out and inspects the houses for the 12 plants, make sure there's not more. Um, so it's, it's a loaded question um, that has the present council um, very concerned. But again, we're, we're uh, looking at, at the issue and um, we'll do our best to keep it under control um, because it's, it's ultimately um, the children who uh, the parents are concerned about. The marijuana, smoking marijuana isn't the big issue, it's the edibles. And again, we need to have enforcement, control, uh, possible limitations. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't welcome the uh, medical marijuana dispensary on Condolin Road. Uh, again, the people spoke out. And I, again, I can't say enough. I encourage when this issue, all issues, come before the city council, that the citizens come out and speak. Because I can honestly tell you, we govern differently in front of people. And I welcome to have a full audience at City Council. Uh, so this issue is uh, being watched and we'll do the right thing uh, for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Salino. Okay. Joe. Yeah. Joe, Joe. Joe. Joe Salino. Me, All right. <laughs> I'm not hearing you. It's, uh, it's a difficult question. I think when a lot of us uh, voted for to make uh, marijuana legal, uh, we didn't quite realize that uh, what was in the back alley, so it was going to be now on Main Street in broad daylight. And I think a lot of people now are kind of hesitant to, to have uh, these shops either in their neighborhood or on Main Street or out in the open. But uh, it is legal, so uh, we have to move forward on how to deal with them. And my, uh, my opinion is that it will probably end up back to the voters, uh, we'll probably do a referendum. And we're going to ask uh, you all to tell us how many uh, marijuana shops do you want to have? You know, we can have a maximum of four. So you can choose, uh, uh, the city council would have to do four. Anything less than four, we'd have to get permission from the voters. So I think we're going to put that out. We're going to say, how many do you want? One, two, three, four. And, and that would be the number of shops. And then we'd have to work like a liquor store, uh, have those kind of regs. We're waiting for the state to come back to us and tell us what those will be. We certainly don't want them next to a church. We certainly don't want them next to a teen center. We don't want them next to a school. So there has to be some kind of regulation and zoning you know, to, to make that happen. One of the thoughts is that uh, possibly put it into uh, 
Blackburn Industrial Park. And, uh, and that would be a place that would, you would have the opportunity to buy it in Gloucester, but you, you know, you would really have to be on a destination and a mission uh, to, uh, you know, see the bongs and the window and, and all the other paraphernalia that goes along with it. Uh, I think that's what's offensive to people. Uh, you know, we have a couple of shops uh, that, are, that are doing that now. Um, we are, we understand it, we have the forums and, uh, and people uh, are for uh, legalizing marijuana, but they're very hesitant on how we're going to place them and uh, we hear you. And uh, so be looking forward for that uh, referendum. Thank you. I think it's a very important question, Deacon Dan, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I, I have to say, we as a city council uh, are really unprepared to answer the question because the state is really putting us behind the eight ball. They haven't got their act together at the state level. I mean, the Cannabis Control Commission, I don't even think it's totally been appointed yet. I mean, they haven't started getting up rules and regulations, law enforcement issues, um, you know, how it's going to be, you know, whether edibles or, or, or the smoking products are going to be the ones that end up being sold rec for recreational marijuana. There's a lot of questions they have to answer. And we did the absolute right thing. I, I applaud the administration and the health department and the police department specifically uh, through Mayor, uh, Mayor Taken's administration for pushing very hard for the moratorium because they're absolutely right. We have so much work to do on zoning. Where in town would it go if we had it? On whether or not there's going to be a referendum to go back on the ballot to eliminate it or how many? One, two, three, four? Right now we could have, as, we could have more than that. So it's going to be something we have to bring back to the full council or to the people or both. And there's so many questions unanswered that we really can't even speak intelligently, in my opinion, about what we should be expecting. So I think it's a little bit premature, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, the, the health department and the police department were absolutely right when they said there's unanswered questions that we need answered before we can make intelligent decisions at the city level about time, place, and manner, and, and that we have to do. So, I mean, um, I, I, I applaud the council and the administration for, for, for going, coming together and doing this moratorium. And, and let's see it out. I mean, we got to take the long view here and get it right so that we're not rolling it out with all sorts of problems and, and issues that we can't solve. The police have to be trained. People have to know and expect where it is. And uh, on a side note, uh, I was appointed as a tourism commission liaison. And one of the things we're addressing in subcommittee is signage and design standards. I have to applaud Councilor LeBlanc on filing his council order on the design standards when the smoke shop on Washington Street had the bongs in the windows and it was such an outrage. Well, that was because we were acting reactively rather than proactively. So I'm glad that the Tourism Commission, led by Pauline Bresnahan, and with five new members that I recruited, are taken up and tackling these issues to make recommendations so that we can have design standards in place when these recreational marijuana shops do potentially come to town so that we don't have to have this outrage of bongs in the windows and the like, just like we wouldn't have a liquor store with a bunch of liquor bo uh, bottles in the window. So I think it's an important question. I appreciate you bringing it up, but I just say we probably can't really fully answer the question at this juncture because we don't have all the information we need from the state. Thank you, Jim. It, it is an important question, and actually it's one that we are, um, as, as uh, other counselors have mentioned, that we are trying to put in a proper perspective and not have us as uh, counselors get it too far out in front of advocating for how many shops and advocating for where they should be. That really is a, uh, is a decision that we need from, from, the, uh, from the citizens because it is a quality of life issue. Uh, where, uh, where and how many. Um, it's probably, and the, the moratorium, which uh, technically uh, the state law says that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, shops can open by July 1st, 2018, unless there is a local moratorium, we have chosen to extend that time period to December of 2018, which gives us the opportunity to kind of, uh, of uh, have uh, uh, input from everyone in terms of just what it is is going to be in these shops and how, what kind of accessibility there would be for, uh, for uh, 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 the citizens. Um, but more importantly, um, how many? And um, as uh, has been alluded to, the, the way the state law is constructed, there is a, uh, the minimum number is a percentage of the liquor licenses, which in our town translates into four. Uh, uh, retail marijuana shops. Um, anything less than that, we have to go back to the voters. Anything more than that, the city council can approve. Um, but we're not about to do that right now. And I think that as we go forward over the next uh, uh, 12 months or so, 
we will hopefully get to a point where we will be able to frame a question for the ballot in November of 2018 about just how many and um, what their character is. I voted, I voted for medical marijuana because I really feel that if you need something to relieve pain and, you, you, and nothing else will work, you should be able to use anything you want and the, the FDA uh, should stay out of it. Um, but I voted against the uh, recreational marijuana because I think it brings so many problems. And I hope if we, if we put this before the voters, uh, as Joe said, one, two, three, or four, I hope zero is in there too. Because uh, just because you voted to have legalized marijuana uh, doesn't mean you want it here. Um, there are sev several uh, municipalities that uh, don't have lottery tickets sold in their community because they voted not to. So I think that option should be open. And the other thing is we should make sure if we do have them, uh, where they go. And I think uh, the industrial park is probably the only place I would be in favor of. So I hope we, I hope we do this. Let the voters decide. And then we'll have to, of course, we have to do what they want. All right, thank you. I'll take one more question. And on the answers, we're just going to keep you to one minute because we have closing statements. Uh, but please. <laughs> uh, Gloucester has a long heritage as an arts community and now has two cultural designations, Brocken Neck and Downtown. And the American Craft Council voted uh, this year for Gloucester as the number 10 craft city in the country to visit. So with that uh, introduction, how does the uh, Council, see the city and the council's role and the vision for the arts. You want to start with that, uh, Joe Orlando? That's a great question, thank you. Um, I will say this. I spoke a little bit earlier about the fishing industry and our heritage and how that's our history. Another huge piece of our heritage is our art community and our history there. And I think we should be emphasizing that as well, also through tourism. And I think one of the best things we can do for our community is to flood the streets with tourists to, to see it, to buy it, to support the studios, and to make sure it's seen around the world. So my vision is to, through the Tourism Commission and my job here, hopefully if I'm lucky enough to get a second term, I'll be back on the Tourism Commission as the liaison. I would like to see a comprehensive approach where we have maps available, and I think we have some now, but we're, we consolidate all those maps into really one booklet that can, you have a page just for the arts, where you have a page just for open space and recreational places, museums, and uh, bars and restaurants and hotels and the like. And I think the arts has to be emphasized through tourism as much as we emphasize anything else. So I only had one minute, I'm a bit of a talker, I'm sorry, I could go on for hours, but thank you for the question. Joe Salino. Glosser is Economy is, you know, so you can describe it as a three-legged uh, stool. One is, uh, they know, the manufacturing, uh, the fishing industry, and the tourism. And the tourism, I feel, is, is, is into uh, the arts and crafts also, because uh, there, there is the market for, for that. Uh, Gloucester has a long tradition of uh, supporting the artists back from the 1800s uh, and, and now. And uh, I can say this, is that I've traveled around the country and then a lot of people, if their children decide to be artists, uh, they panic and say, how are you going to earn a living? Well, you know what, in Gloucester, you can earn a living as, uh, as being an artist because of the light of the, of the or whether the visitors and the customers and all the rest of it. It's a long-standing tradition. I've always supported the arts. I will continue to support the arts, especially in the schools, and uh, which we are doing now. And, uh, you know, having all our production companies, the Scholastic Stage Company, Theater in the Pines, you know, it goes on and on. For a small community, we have a lot going on here for the arts. And uh, if elected once again, I, I have continued to support it, and I will support it again. Jen. As the previous gentlemen have mentioned, our history and heritage in the arts goes back centuries. My, as I mentioned, my great-grandfather, Hafton Hansen, was the architect of the Beauport Sleeper McCann House. He collaborated for 27 years with Henry Davis Sleeper on the building, and that is something that me and my family are very proud of. That is architecture uh, and interior design are only two disciplines uh, that Gloucester can boast. We have 
a history of painting, sculpture, crafts, uh, theater, and uh, I would, <laughs> I would be completely remiss to say that we would not support the arts as a council uh, or as a city. That is absolutely part of what makes us who we are. And uh, I, I'm very excited that we've earned that craft designation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the arts is, is a valuable asset to our city. Um, we circle, circle around. I've, I've spoken to many artists. Obviously, not everyone is making a living. They're struggling. Most artists do struggle. We, it circles back to the affordable housing component. Supporting the arts is supporting them in its entirety. Um, having some place for the artists to display their artwork so it can be seen by the public, so maybe that artist can be discovered. We here at the library, I being a board member, we've had an art show here annually in July. And so many of the artists just can't wait to have that art show. We need to support it by having some place where the artists can perform their artwork. I'm not gifted. Uh, an artist is a special person. So we need the spot for the artists to work. We need some place for the artists to be able to live. Um, the tourists love the art. I love the art. But it, it's, a, it's a problem. And I think um, the affordable housing component ties in to supporting the arts. Thank you. Thank you. Want to pass it that note down to Bob, please? Thank you very much. Can I go first? No, he, he said Bob, but you can go. You go ahead. I thought you said Bob. Yeah, I said, I said okay. Bob. We just all agree like Bob. That's all. Yeah, I, I, I like I like the uh, the fact that we have the oldest uh, art colony in the United States down at Rocky Neck. And I think uh, we should spend, spend more time promoting that as well as the fishing so that people, the tourists that come here uh, can see that too. We have a great place for artists. They, they're everywhere. If you go down to the, the uh, Cannons or any place in Stage Fort Park or, or on the waterfront, you'll see people uh, painting. I think the one thing we do to make things easier is make it easier for the zoning for them to have a, an art gallery upstairs in their house and maybe sell some of their, their paintings and not have to go and, and hire commercial uh, spaces. And uh, I think that that would work in a, in a neighborhood where some things might not, but I think the art, the, um, art studios would. So I'm, I'm all in favor of uh, tourism. Is very, tourism is very big in, in Gloucester. We need it, and uh, we need to support it. And I think that the art, the art uh, industry uh, would, would be a big help. So in Gloucester, we are blessed with a, uh, an abundance of artists in all mediums and have been for hundreds of years and that's really a very special um, uh, asset that we have. Uh, one of the cultural districts, the Rocky Neck Cultural District, um, has, is, is, is a great place to start looking at a blueprint for how to promote um, the artists. Uh, they have done a tremendous job of programming over the last couple of years since they've been in existence. Uh, programming involving organizing, you know, uh, exhibitions and uh, and performances, getting the word out. Those are the kind of things that we need to uh, promote. We, the city, need to promote that kind of uh, effort on uh, promoting cultural tourism, and uh, that's uh, that's a that's that's that will be our role in that because uh, we're lucky to have the artists here. We just need to be able to support their venues. Thank you for the question. Now we're going to have your closing statements. Uh, Bob, why not? Would you start with your two-minute closing statement, James? I'm not going to take two minutes. Uh, I think a lot of people know me here. I've run 40 elections in this room, and uh, and all over the city. Um, I've been. I was born in Gloucester. Went to Gloucester High. Graduated in 1963. Bryant and Stratton in 1966, and I went to. Uh, College Knights, and I graduated from Franklin Pierce, Franklin Pierce College in 1987. Uh, I have a, a beautiful wife and two beautiful children. Um, my son is a lawyer, and, and my daughter is a school teacher, and they both went beyond and had graduate degrees. So um, as, far as, as far as the promises, I only make two promises to anybody. One, I will listen to all sides of an argument, and then I will do my own research, and I will vote the way I feel is best for the city as a whole. Number two is I answer every email 
every telephone, and if you stop me on the street, I'll give you the time to, to bend my ear and tell me what your problem is, and you'll always get an answer. You may not like that answer, but you'll always get one. And uh, I think the fact that I've been in city, city government since 1976, and I've seen it all. We brought the charter in, we brought tax classification in, and Proposition two and a half, and we, we rebuilt the, uh, the, uh, the reservoir at Goose Cove to the, fact, to the point where we would never have a water shortage again. Maybe we have a little delivery problem at times, but there's plenty of water. And uh, I was proud of that. And we brought uh, Varian into Gloucester uh, when Beverly wanted it desperately. And uh, we gave them the land, and we even processed the land for them. And they've been here, and they've paid taxes, and they've, uh, they've uh, employed a lot of people over the years. So I think if you want an old dog to, that knows what, I've uh, been around the block a few times, I'm ready, willing, and still able to work. Thank you. So my first um, assignment in city government was on the planning board, um, and that was uh, 20, uh, 17 years ago. I was appointed by Mayor Toby to the planning board because I asked him uh, that I would like to give back something to the city, and he said, well, this is a great place for you to do that, so go there. Well, I was uh, unprepared for what the planning board uh, uh, presented to me because and it is where I have uh, found my uh, love and respect for, uh, for uh, civic uh, government. Um, at the local level, the people who come to address the government, uh, as in the planning board, come because they have a very specific thing that they need to get done and they feel very strongly about it. Um, oftentimes, they are, their neighbors come along because they feel strongly the other way. And uh, what the, uh, you know, and the, and the planning board, is, like many of our boards, uh, is just a uh, is a, a, one, a splendid uh, example of democracy because these are all volunteers who do this, but the passion that the people bring to uh, to those issues, and the seriousness by which you have to make the decisions really impressed me as being something important to be able to do. Um, as an elected official, I feel the same way. I feel that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, the two characteristics of a of a good elected official is listening and being uh, and teamwork and uh, we'll, everyone will say the listening part and I think that we're all pretty good listeners and that's really important. Uh, what you do with that listening is, is also important and how you process that into a solution that uh, uh, really solves uh, as many problems as you can. There will be times when you can't uh, solve everybody's problem but if you give it a sincere effort uh, as I will, um, there's a good chance that uh, we'll have a, a good outcome. So I uh, thank you for listening to us tonight, all of us. Uh, we're all going to ask for your vote, and I think you're very fortunate to have such a qualified slate. <clears throat> thank you all for coming tonight. When I first ran for city council two years ago, I promised that I would be a solution-based leader. Because to me, there's nothing worse than someone in city government or any level of government that talks about problems but doesn't put, roll up their sleeves and try to solve them and come to a solution. The way I do that is by building consensus among my peers and the people that we work with. We have a great relationship with the mayor. We don't always agree. I think she, if she were here, she'd probably tell you I'm a thorn in her side a lot. She may not use that type of language, but she'd probably tell you that we don't always get along. But we always are able to sit down and discuss an issue and come to some kind of consensus because we're well-meaning people who care about this community. I have a great relationship with Councillor Sean Nolan, and I'm very proud, so honored, to have his endorsement in this race. And I really appreciate everything that he's willing to invest in me as a candidate leading uh, the city forward in the future. We also don't agree on everything, but we also sit down and we have conversations and we come to consensus. I'll say the same for Councillor LeBlanc, who I'm also very honored to have his endorsement. Councillor LeBlanc in Ward 3, Councillor, he and I are able to sit down, have a discussion if we disagree, and we do sometimes, and come to some kind of consensus, some kind of common ground. And I will do that with anybody that you elect me to be on a board or the city council with. But one thing I will not be, and I promised this two years ago as well, is a rubber stamp. We should never govern differently if a group of people are in front of us if the, than if they're not. We should make the right decisions for the future of Gloucester. And I will always do that because I have two little boys at home that when I go home at the end of the day, I'm not just accountable to you, I'm accountable to them. I want them to raise their families in Gloucester just like I am, just like my parents did, just like their parents did. And that means that every decision I make will be taken with a 
huge amount of seriousness. If I could get a better word right now, I would. Uh, but the idea being that these decisions are not just going to affect me and the people in this room, but they're going to affect my kids. And that means a hell of a lot to me. So I would ask for your vote on November 7th, because I intend to be a solution-based leader. I also intend to listen and process, and I will always make the decision I think is best, whether that's the most popular decision at the time or not. Thank you. Uh, I started off my political career as a Ward 1 counselor, and then I did that for a couple terms and then turned over to at large. And one of the reasons I went for at large is because when uh, being on Main Street every day, people would come in and talk about uh, other wards and uh, look for looking for aid and help uh, and guidance for, for whatever was going on in their wards. We, uh, I was uh, fortunate and, uh, and honored uh, two years ago to be uh, voted in as city council president. And I've tried to run the meeting. I had five brand new counselors and uh, two of them are right here, and I tell them they have come a long way, and I'm very, very proud of them, especially the way the, the, the answers that they had uh, tonight. But we have a lot of work to do. Uh, working with the administration, sometimes, again, as Council Orlando said, we don't always agree. But we're all going to working towards the same end. And uh, the way our city government is, is that the mayor proposes and the city council disposes. It has to come from the mayor, and then we work to find the solutions. And the, uh, the city council also has a checkbook and uh, writes the checks. So that's an, uh, an awesome responsibility uh, that the uh, councilors have. We need not always to agree with each other, but we need to work together. And sometimes the word team is overrated, but I think as a city council, you need to be a team member. You need to play well with others. Uh, this council that we've had uh, this year has worked very well, has worked very hard, and they've done, the new councils have done extra work to, uh, uh, to, to catch up with uh, some of the other councils. You know, we've been talking about Councilor Nolan, he's done a terrific job. Uh, he was one of my new councils. So I'm asking for you one of your four votes. I bring to the table experience, ability, and vision, and I also bring the institutional memory. And uh, moving forward, I will work very hard for you, and I'm available all the time at 153 Main Street. I come to you as the only candidate at this table who has never held public office before. I understand that this is an ambitious position to run for, and people asked me why I didn't go for Ward 5, and it's because I want to cast a vote for that gentleman over there in the red shirt, Sean Nolan. He's done a tremendous job and we've gotten to know each other very well over these past two years. I want to ask you to put your faith in me on November 7th. As a registered nurse, I am capable of having the most difficult conversations you can possibly imagine. I treat situations I run across with compassion. I can be assertive when I need to be. I can be tactful. And I also work very hard to get my job done. I live on 385 Magnolia Ave with my loving husband and daughter who couldn't be here tonight there at West Parish enjoying Halloween night. But I am in love with this community just like you are, and I hope that you will consider voting for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for turning out tonight to listen to uh, the candidates. Um, I've enjoyed my two-year term representing the citizens of Gloucester to the taxpayers, and I look forward to another two years. We have serious issues ahead of us. Obviously, we've, we've touched base on some of them here tonight, but there are just so many, and it all comes down to dollars and cents. The schools being a, a huge issue, obviously, as, as I opened with, we, we owe it to every child to provide the finest of educations when he or she crosses Newell Stadium to receive his or her diploma. We know the student knows it all, but we also really know that they don't. We owe it to every parent and every student to provide that a learning environment so they can learn, and teachers and administration so that they can lead. As a counselor, 
I will continue to, to answer the calls that you have, everyone knocking door to door. Everyone has an issue. It's typically a neighborhood issue. Someone's speeding, a pothole, trash pickup. You name it, everyone has an issue. I, will, I listen, I answer the phone, I return calls. I'll talk to the mayor's office, the mayor's administration, the fellow councilors. I, I roll up the sleeves, but most importantly, you, everyone knows that I'm, I'm a huge fan of the fire department and keeping the fire stations and the police department fully manned to protect us. This goes back for many years, not just as a city councilor. I took this on 10 years ago. I think that should be the highest priority of the city of Gloucester and any city to protect the public. So you won't find anyone that will work any harder for you and your family in the city of Gloucester. So on November 7th, I ask for one of your four votes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate all of you coming. Uh, thank you for your thoughtful answers. Uh, and thank you all for coming, because if you didn't come, we wouldn't have had much of a night, would we? <laughs> Hopefully, the, the, the candidates will hang around a little bit if you uh, want to ask some individual questions. But uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate your attendance. <laughs>